So on your calendar here, you have a quiz on Monday. And that quiz, so I try and tell you ahead of time, I don't give pop quizzes. Um, I may send out a remind the night before. That might be how you find out, but it's not like you're just going to show up and I had never said anything about it. But this quiz will include, it could include anything that we've done this week. So everything you have with you. That should help you prepare for that quiz. All right, so I want you to look at the factoring flow chart. Um, factoring is not new to you. None of this should be brand new to you, all right? Uh, this yellow bar up at the top says, first, always factor out the greatest common factor, or GCF, if one exists. May not exist. If it does, factor it out, makes your life easier. Down at the bottom here, there's a little disclaimer that says something like, if it doesn't contain a variable, then if you don't factor it out, it's fine, but it's going to make your life easier, basically, if you do. If you're supposed to factor completely and you don't factor it out, that's a problem, but it won't change your solution if you're actually solving it. But it does make your number smaller or makes it easier. We're not going to talk about um, some of the, most of these special cases today, but one thing I do want to point out, this is just a good reference sheet for you to, to keep um, handy, that this SOAP, I don't think that's anything that... Um, y'all have seen before. This is a little acronym that helps you with the sum and difference of cubes because a lot of times what I find is that students remember the pattern, like you can get that part out, but then the signs you get confused about which one goes where and when. So the acronym stands for same, opposite, always positive. So if this is the difference of cubes, your signs are the same, opposite, always positive. So when it's the sum and that's a plus sign, then it's the same, opposite, always positive. And that'll help you make sure your signs are in the right place. So you put the signs there, then you can figure out the numbers and you're not having to worry about both at the same time. Does that make sense? We good? All right. So just hang on to that. Like I said, we'll look, um, we'll look at that a little bit more in just a minute. All right. So I want you to look at the factor review. Okay. That's what we're going to look at next. The factory view, oh, we need to pick these up up here. Yes, sir. That's okay. All right, so we're not going to do all of these, but we're going to do some of these together. First thing up here, it should say factor the, it should say greatest common factor. Not just the common factor, but it's the greatest common factor out of each expression. So let's look at number two. I want to factor out the greatest common factor in number two. So can I factor any P's out? Yes. So I could factor out just P or P squared. Okay, so let's look at the numbers now. You always want to try and have your leading coefficient positive if possible. So we're going to factor out a negative for sure. Um, can I factor out a negative 8? No. 16 is divisible by 8, but 20 isn't. Um, 4? Could I use 4? Yes, 4 would work, so I can factor out a negative 4. Negative 2 works also, but it's not the greatest common factor, so keep that in mind. There's a difference between that. So then what I'm left with is what right here? What would my number be? 2, and then P cubed, and then... This would be plus or minus? Plus, because I factored out that negative. So be careful. Make sure your signs aren't going to kill you here. And if I divide that by 4, I get 5 and then P squared. No? If this is P to the 4th and I took out P squared, it's P squared. All right, and then this should be positive what? 4. Any P? Nope. And we're done, right? So we can all factor out a GCF? Yes, good to go. All right, let's look at number four. On number four, can I factor out a GCF? No, okay, plus A is already one, so that's good, right? So um, my A time, if I take A times C, which A is one, so it doesn't really matter, I get negative 30. So I need two numbers that multiply to give me negative 30, but that will combine to give me 7. There are things that you know right now that I don't think some of you realize you know. You can go ahead and set up a whole bunch of this before I worry about any numbers. I know that this has to be B and this has to be B. And the signs themselves here tell me a lot. 
The fact that this is negative means that the signs have to be different, right? That's the only way I'm going to get these two to multiply to give me a negative is if the signs are different. So I know that one of them is plus and one of them is minus. I know that for sure. So that means not only do they have to multiply to give me a negative 30, they're going to have to subtract or I need their difference to be 7, right? So your possibilities, and I realize on this one you may not have to like write them all out, but I'm going to write a few of them out just for this first time. It could be 1 and 30 could be my options. I could do 2 and 15, right? It could be 3 and 10. Oops. 4 doesn't work. 5 and 6, that would work, right? So I'm not saying you always have to write them all out, but sometimes you will need to because the first one that pops in your head doesn't work, so you just kind of need to have a way to process it. So which two will subtract to give me 7? 3 and 10. And which one will be my positive number? 10. And this would be 3, and we're good. Then you want to check yourself. All right, I'm not saying rework, re, rework the whole thing, but just make sure that you know positive 10 and a negative 3 actually give you a negative 30, and that 10b and negative 3b gives you whatever's there so that you don't have your signs backwards or made a bad decision or something. We all good? Any questions? Awesome. All right, stop me if you have a question. All right, let's look at number eight. Can I factor a GCF out here? No, okay? Because even if you're not sure about 34, hopefully you know 7 doesn't go into 24, right? And let me just tell you this. The thing that will help you the most with factoring is knowing your multiplication facts. I don't even know y'all, but I'm pretty confident a lot of you don't know them, okay? That's just the general, that's just how it is anymore. If you don't, you need to. It will help you in all of this, I promise. Go home, make yourself flashcards. Get an app on your phone to do it. If you have little brothers and sisters or cousins, you can help them practice their multiplication facts for school, right? They don't need to know you're learning with them, but you need to know them. And the more you know, see, it's like secret. Oh, sure, I'll help you, you know? And you just look like so sweet because you're helping them out and it's really about you, but that's okay. At least you're learning them, all right? But do it for real. And what that takes is drill and practice. And that's what it is. Just, that's why a little flashcard or some little, find a game, an app game that you can download. And I promise you, you, you will be less stressed out in math if you're not always held up on those multiplication facts because that's really what drags you down a lot, especially on factoring, okay? So I can't, I can't factor out a GCF. When A is not 1, I can't really do it in one step like that. Some people can. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying I usually can't do it because I can't reason through it that well like that, and it's not the best way. You can factor in different ways. Have we all learned factoring by grouping? Okay, and I realized last period some people were like, I don't think they knew what it was called. It's when we actually make it into four terms and then you factor something out. Does that sound familiar? Okay, you can also factor using the box or whatever, but grouping is the best because grouping is going to help you when you have four terms or more than three. You're not gonna have some other little tricks, so grouping is something that you're gonna need to understand, all right? So we're gonna do factoring by grouping, which means you take A times C, which we just did up there, but it was one, so it was not that exciting. But we're going to take 7 times 24, which is already stressing you out, I know. But here's what you do. What's 7 times 20? Yeah, 140. Okay, so 7 times 20 is 140. That's easy, right? 7 times 4 is 28, right? So then together that gives me 168, and it's not that bad. Now, I chose this example to do on purpose because 168 is a big number. And there's lots of options for factors here to come up with what works. Don't let that stress you out. I want you to learn to work more efficiently, meaning what you would probably do here, at least most of you, is kind of a guess and check thing to find your factors. Am I right about that? Well, let's see if this divides. Let's see if that divides. And so sometimes you're trying stuff that doesn't work, and it's taking you forever. You've got work all over the place. Sometimes the thing that does work, you think doesn't because you divided wrong, and now you're really confused, right? Am I right? Like, I know what's happening with you. So I want you to learn a more efficient way of doing it. Instead of stressing yourself out like that, and you don't necessarily need to do it on the smaller numbers that you're more comfortable with, but something like this that you probably can't rattle the factors off the top of your head, it's fine, neither can I. But what I do know, I do know that one set is 7 and 24. So, hey, I got that right now. That's not the one that works, but at least I know one of them. If you can do what's called the prime factorization, right, which means that I know that, I know that there's 7, and then if I multiply that, so I'm going to take 24, I can divide it by 2, that gives me 12, 
Divided by 2 again, I get 6. Divided by 2 again, I get 3. So if I multiply all this back together, watch this. 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 3 is 24, right? So all of these numbers will multiply back together to give me 168. You with me? Doing that can really be a huge value to you. Because here's how I can find my factors now without a whole bunch of guessing and checking. This is what builds my number. These are my only choices. So if I take 7 times 2, I know that that's 14, right? So I've used 7 and 2. Now when I do 2 times 2, which is 4 times 3, that's 12. Guess what? 14 times 12 is 168. You didn't do any dividing. You didn't do any multiplying of big numbers. You with me on that? Now, is that the, the set that works? No, unfortunately not, but at least that didn't take me too much time and I wasn't too stressed out. You with me? So now if I do 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 is 8. So I've used all my 2s. That's 8. What's 3 times 7? 21. Well, guess what? 8 times 21 is 168. There's another set of factors. Now let's say I wanted 2. Well, instead of doing 2 and then multiplying all the rest of those together, in this case, it might be easier for me to take 168 and divide it by 2 in my head or off to the side and get 84. So I'm not saying necessarily even do this all the time if it's easier to divide by 2, but you learn some options so you can do whatever's easiest at that time. That's why it's good to have options. You with me? I'm not trying to make this harder. I'm trying to make it easier. You with me? Okay. And that takes some practice. It's all good. I can do 2 times 3, which is 6. And then 2 times 2, which is 4 times 2, which is, I'm sorry, 2 times 2, which is 4 times 7, which is 28. Are any of these the one that's going to work? 6 and 28, because I need them to multiply to give me this number. And this is positive, so the signs are the same. They need to add to give me 34. Those are my options there. Do you see how I don't have any crazy multiplication anywhere and I have big numbers that don't need to freak me out? Okay. We feeling a little okay about this? All right, so now we'll get to the actual grouping part of this. So I've got 7b squared. Now, these are my two numbers. doesn't matter which one comes first. It's going to be plus 6b plus 28b plus 24. We good? All right, so now I'm going to, this is where I start factoring out again. I'm going to group these two together and these two together. Just from those first two terms, what can I factor out? B. It's the only thing I can factor out. So I factor out the B. I'm left with 7B plus 6, right? The next two terms, what's the biggest thing I can factor out? Four, and it's a positive 4, and I'm left with 7b plus 6. What's in the parentheses should match. If it doesn't, then either you didn't factor out the GCF or your factors are wrong, like something's going on there that, that's not right. Now, do you understand that at this point, the next step you do is factoring out the GCF again? You've got these two big terms. You see that? And they have this factor in common, so I'm going to factor it out. I'm going to pull it out front, and it's 7b plus 6, and then that leaves me with that b plus 4. Even though that might seem kind of drawn out, way easier than guessing and checking, because it's hard to reason through some of that when you're doing it. Okay, are we good so far? Yes, sir. Okay, where, where did I get all these numbers? Is that what you're asking me? Okay, so what I did was I took 168 and basically did like a factor tree. I didn't like show it, but I'll show you so you can do it. It makes it a little bit easier. Factor tree that you probably started in elementary school the very first time you ever talked about factors. If you, Depending on how you learned how to simplify radicals, you might have also kind of done something like that. So if I had this 168, I actually started knowing, started by using these two things because I knew that they multiplied to give me 168. So that would be like 7 and 24. And it's called prime factorization because you're trying to get to all prime numbers, right? So 7 is my prime number. And then I can get two factors of 24. That could be 2 and 12. 
and then I can get 2 and 6, and then that can become 2 and 3. Basically, I was just splitting it up to the smallest numbers that could multiply all back together to give me 168. Does that make sense? And this factor tree here is kind of an organized way to do it. The bigger the number, the more organized way you need to get those numbers out. Otherwise, you get lost in how many twos or whatever you have. So once you make it to a prime number, circle it. Prime number, circle it. And if it's not a prime number, then you just keep breaking it up. And you can break it up however you want. I could have made 24, 3, and 8 right here, and circled my 3 and then worked with my 8. You'll get the same numbers in the end. Okay? That's a very good question. Anything else? Just make sure once you've decided what they are that they actually multiply back to give you this. Otherwise, you're wasting your time and none of your numbers will make sense. You'll be really confused. We're good? Okay. All right. Oh, so at this point now, do I set these two terms equal to zero? No. Why not? Because it just says to factor, right? If it didn't say that or I didn't understand the instructions, how else do you know that you are not setting them equal to zero right now? It doesn't have an equal sign. If it's not an equation, you can't solve it. If there's no equal sign, it's not an equation, right? So plus it says factor completely. If it had an equal sign, if, it, if these said equal to zero, I'm quite certain some of y'all would do all this and keep going and solve it, even though it doesn't even say that. It was still factor completely. I'm done. This is factored completely right here. Okay? All right, let's do 12. We're going to do one more of these together. So 15b squared minus 55b plus 30. Can I factor out a GCF? Five. five. Okay, so I'm going to factor out a 5. That's going to leave me with 3b squared minus 11b plus 6. Now, it's nice when we factor out a GCF if A is 1, which it's not. So we're going to need to do the grouping again. There's a reason I'm doing another grouping, um, just also so you can see another one. But you take A times C, so that's going to be 3 times 6, which is going to give me 18, right? This is positive, which means the two signs have to be the same because they're going to multiply to give me this number in the end. So it's either positive times positive or negative times negative. Since this is negative... That means they both have to be negative. Does that make sense to you? And the factors are still going to add to give me that number right there. So my factors of 18 are 1 and 18, 2 and what? 9, 3 and 6, okay? And then that's it. So which ones am I going to use? 2 and 9, right? And if you don't understand how to, whether, they, whether or not they have to add or subtract to give you this number, sometimes that makes you pick the wrong factors because you may have factors that like either one of them would work. In this case, that doesn't happen. But So you want to make sure you know what, what your goal is here. So this is going to become 5 times 3b squared minus 2b minus 9b plus 6. So we cannot drop the 5 off. He's important. He just hangs out at the front and waits for everything to, to be done, but we can't lose him along the way. And when we go to the next step of this grouping, the parentheses can get confusing. So what I would suggest here, if you have a GCF out there and you're about to do some of this grouping stuff here, I would change the outside ones to brackets so you don't get lost in all your parentheses. This is what I mean by that. 5, I'm going to make that a bracket because it's still got to break it off. Then I'm going to look at these two terms. What can I factor out? B. So that leaves me with 3B minus 2. What do I factor out here? Negative 3. Watch your signs because that's going to give me 3B. And then what's this going to become? negative 2 because I factored out that negative so I got to change the sign there plus you know it has to match here so everybody with me so far so now I just needed my brackets there so the parentheses didn't just throw me off sometimes you start confusing yourself with what you're writing um, I don't really need the brackets anymore because I've got the 5 that 3 mi 3 B minus 2 is going to come out front and then I'm left with that B minus 3 and that's factored completely. Okay. You got to know how to factor. 
that is going to be like a little piece of some of the bigger things that we do. And if you can't get things factored, you can't get any farther in the work that we're doing. Okay. So if you are struggling with this and you need to knock the cobwebs off more than maybe somebody else does, spend some time in Khan Academy. And these, these are the kind of things that it just takes drill and practice. You just need to keep doing it over and over again. All right. Any questions? All right. Let's look at the second set, uh, the second green paper that says X and Y intercepts. This is going on page 28 when we're done. Uh huh. Yes. Okay, you can go. You, we're not going to glue it in today anyway because we're not going to set them up until Monday, so you can grab it. It's fine. Just hang on to your stuff and don't put anything in there yet. Okay. All right. So, X and Y intercepts. Mo today should be review as well. Tomorrow there'll be some stuff that may not be a review, but this is just another part of a review. So X and Y intercepts. Intercepts are points where a graph intersects the X or Y axis. That's what our intercepts are. An X intercept occurs where Y equals what? Zero. Good. And a Y intercept occurs where X equals zero. So we've talked about relations and functions. Right now we're just talking about functions. So a function can have zero plus x-intercepts. Maybe my function doesn't have any. Maybe it has five. Maybe it has an infinite amount. But for y-intercepts, you can have at most one y-intercept. So either I don't have a y-intercept or I only have one. Because if it has more than one y-intercept, it's not a function because it'll fail that vertical line test on the y-axis. Right? So only one y-intercept is possible. We're going to look first at finding them graphically. So just from a graph, you don't necessarily have to know what the equations are that go with these graphs. That's not what it's asking you for, just the intercepts. So x-intercepts, how many do I have on this graph? One, and it is right here. When you write an x-intercept, it has to be written in what form? How do you write it? Do I just wait? So what is the x value right there? Four. So do I just write that my x-intercept is four? No. What does it have to be? Ordered pair. Very good. And x, when it is the intercept, it has to be an ordered pair. So it is four, zero. Notation is important. Got to make sure you're answering the, correct, the question correctly. So what's my y-intercept? Zero, two. Very good, because that's got to be an ordered pair as well. All righty. How many x-intercepts do I have on number two? Four. Good. So they're right here. I'm going to mark them so it's easier to see them. I have one here at negative 1, 0. Then at 1, 0, 2, 0, and 3, 0. All right? Do I have a y-intercept? Yes, it is right here. So it is 0. Is it six? Okay, good. Alrighty, number three. How many x-intercepts do I have? Two. And they're right there. So I'm here at negative what? Four, zero, and two, zero. And what about a y-intercept? There's one y-intercept, and it is at 0, negative 2. Now, do you know the difference between the x and y-axis? Yes, you do. Do you know the difference, or do you know which one of these is supposed to be x and which one is supposed to be y? Yes. Do you write these things right here backwards sometimes, even though you know that stuff? Yes. Don't miss it because of that. Like, think, double-check yourself that you really put the 0 in the right spot, because I know you know how to do it. you got to make sure you're not missing it because you're doing something ridiculous, which, again, we are all capable of, myself included. Number four, how many x-intercepts? None. So my answer is none. Do I have a y-intercept? Yes, it is right here. So I know that is zero, what, five? Are these easy? Yes, so that's good. So I know there's a lot of them. We probably didn't need this many, but they're easy, so we don't complain when it's easy. We just go, good, I'm glad it's easy. Let's keep going. All right, so I have two x-intercepts. The first one is at 
three zero. Where's the next one? Is it seven zero? Do I have a y intercept? Yes. It is at zero what? Negative six. So on number six, how many x-intercepts? None. What about y-intercepts? None. Those are even easier. So any questions about that? We can handle finding them from a graph, yes? Feel okay with that? Good. So now let's talk about zeros. Have we already kind of talked about zeros? What do zeros go with that's up here? X-intercepts, good. Now they're not the exact same thing. You can refer to where the function uh, crosses the x-axis as intercepts, zeros, roots, solutions, um, all those types of things, but technically they represent something a little bit different. So your x-intercept is the actual point. The zeros are the x values where the function intersects the x-axis. Okay. Yeah, this time the word is intersects and not intercepts. Those are two different things. <laughs> it's hard for me to enunciate them differently. But So the zeros are just the x values themselves, not the ordered pair. So to find the zeros, we are going to take f of x and we set f of x equal to what? Zero. And then when we do that, what do we solve for? X, because that's what we're looking for is the X value, right? To find the Y intercept, we're going to find F of what? Zero. Good, because X is zero. Everybody with me on that? All right, so let's do some of these. All right, so we're going to find the zeros and the intercept of each function algebraically. So that means when we start with the zeros, to do that, we set f of x equal to zero. So that means I'm going to get zero equals negative absolute value of x minus five plus three. All I did was set it equal to zero because your first step should really be no work. So now I have to solve for x. This is one big term right here, and it's negative. So I'm going to move it over here to make it positive. So absolute, positive absolute value of x minus five equals Three. When I'm done with this, how many answers am I going to have? Two. Because when you have an absolute value, you've got to solve it twice, right? We're going to take this x minus 5, and I can set it equal to 3. But I also have to take x minus 5 and set it equal to what? Negative 3. Very good, right? Because whether I get a 3 or a negative 3 from x minus 5, it's fine because the absolute value makes it positive. So I get x equals 8, and x equals two. Everybody with me so far? So now how I write these answers is important because remember notation is an important thing. I am not writing ordered pairs because they did not ask me for the intercepts. I know what they are and I could write them but that's not what they're asking. I want zeros. So this is a set of numbers. It's a set of zeros. So that's where these squiggly brackets come in and my zeros are two and eight. Any questions at this point? Okay. So now I'm going to do the y-intercept. So to find the y-intercept, I look for f of 0. So I just substitute in a 0. It's negative absolute value of 0 minus 5 plus 3. So 0 minus 5 is negative 5. The absolute value makes it positive. But then this negative out here makes it negative again, right? So I get negative 5 plus 3. What's that? Negative 2. So negative 2 is equal to f of 0. The, it's asking me for the y-intercept. So how do I write that? An ordered pair. So it should be 0, negative 2. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Ask me questions if you got them. All right, let's look at 8. Now find the 0. So 0 equals 2x squared minus 7x minus 4. 
I need to solve for x, so what am I going to need to do? Factor it, right? And so to do that, I can't factor out a GCF, so I'm going to go with the grouping. So 2 times negative 4 gives me negative 8. I like it when they're smaller numbers, a whole lot less factors to have to deal with, right? So this is going to give me 2x squared. Now I need two numbers that are going to multiply. What? Uh, 1 and 8, yeah, 1 and 8 is real obvious, right? And which one's negative? The 8, okay, so good. So negative 8x plus x minus 4. Everybody with me? Ask me a question if you got one. Do you have a question? Are you sure? Okay. Um, so I'm going to factor this out. Here I can factor out a 2x. That leaves me with x minus 4. What can I factor out of this? What? A 1. Nothing I've heard a lot today. But I have to factor something out or this isn't going to work. Normally, we don't care about factoring out a 1, right? Like, we can't use that as my GCF because that gets me nowhere. But when you're doing by grouping, basically you're factoring out a 1. So this is plus 1, because if you don't write that, you're going to confuse yourself. Okay? It's kind of the only time we really care about the 1 as a factor. So now I factor out that x minus 4, and that leaves me with 2x plus 1 as my other 1. Any questions up to now? Okay, so now do I set them equal to zero? Yes, because I'm solving, like I'm trying to find x. So I take each one of these, so x minus 4 equals zero, and 2x plus 1 equals zero. That means that I get x equals 4 from this one. Here I would get x equals what? Negative 1 half. Do I want a negative 0.5? No, negative one half. Because I subtracted the one and divided by two. Okay, everybody good? Write it as a set here, and I've got negative one half, four. Then I'm going to find my y intercept. Okay, so f of zero is equal to two times zero squared minus seven times zero minus 4. Is that going to be super hard? No, what is it? Negative 4. Because right? those these terms zero out, you're just left with that negative 4. So my y-intercept is 0, negative 4. Everybody good so far? Okay. Alright, let's look at 9. For the zeros, 0 equals x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 4. Can I factor that? Yes. If you aren't quick to say yes, does it freak you out a little bit that it's x to the fourth? Okay. If, it, if that wasn't x to the fourth, if that said x squared plus 5x plus 4, would you feel a whole lot better about it? Probably. Pretend like that's what it says because you can factor it. You factor it exactly like you would if it was the quadratic. So this is going to give me, I'm going to have two factors here. Instead of these being x and x, it's x squared and x squared. Because when I multiply those two together, I get x to the fourth. You with me? And then the rest just plays out the same way. This is positive, which means the signs have to be the same. This is negative, so they're both minus. What are my two numbers? Four and one. And then you can always check yourself. Negative 4 and negative 1 is a positive 4. You got negative 4x, negative, or negative 4x squared, x, negative x squared. That's where that comes from. Everybody with me so far? Can I factor these? This is one of those special cases that's important for you to, to recognize. Like some special cases, okay, if you didn't recognize them, you could just do them the long way. But this is actually very easy to factor. This is a difference of two squares. Okay, so if you look on that little thing as an example, this x squared minus 4, both of these are perfect squares, and it's negative here. So this just becomes x plus 2 and x minus 2. So here, take the square root of both of them, and I get x plus 1, x minus 1. Does that make sense to you? The difference of two squares that's on that little chart there. So then I set these up. So x plus 2 equals 0, x minus 2 equals 0, x 
plus 1 equals 0, x minus 1 equals 0. So when you solve these tiny little easy equations, you're going to get negative 2 and positive 2 here, right? So you can write that as plus or minus 2. And you're going to get negative 1 and positive 1, and you're going to get plus or minus 1. You can write all four of them out separate, but you want to learn to combine some things so you're not writing things out for days all the time. Okay. So my zeros then are plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2. And I have four solutions because it was the next to the fourth there. Okay. All right, so then my y-intercept is f of 0. So this is going to be 0 to the fourth plus 5 times 0 squared plus 4. So what's f of 0? Oh, what's minus? Oh, yeah, minus. And I did mess up, and it was wrong, but it, would it have mattered? No, sometimes when you mess up, you just get lucky and it doesn't matter. But I, but no, you still sort of corrected me, so thank you. It is minus. Uh, so f of 0 is 4. four. This is a 0, 4. Questions? All right. We got time for one more. I want to finish this one. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Maybe. I want to do this one first. This one's actually a lot easier than it looks, and I probably will have time for that one too, but I want to do this one first. I want to make sure I get this one done. If not, I can, I'll can. i do this one tomorrow for you. So 0 is equal to x cubed minus 6x squared minus 7x. So do I have to do some kind of weird cubic factoring here? No. Don't always think the worst. Why no? Factor out the x. Always look for your GCF. So I factor out the x, and I get x squared minus 6x minus 7. Now that I've got there, is that one going to be pretty simple to factor? So it looks kind of hard from the beginning, and it's really not that bad. So x, and then i got these two. So I've got an x and an x. This is negative, so the signs are different. Factors of 7, you only got one choice. You just got to get them in the right place with the right signs. And um, so which one is positive? One or seven? And, and negative seven, because you need that to be negative six. Now, how many solutions am I going to have here? Three. Okay? You can't forget about this guy. He gets forgotten a lot, and that's not real nice. So x equals zero, x plus one equals zero, and x minus seven equals zero. So this is one of them. This gives me x equals negative one and x equals 7. I have 3. Don't forget about that x that you factor out. He's still important. So this is negative 1, 0, and 7. Yes? Okay. Then I need to find f of 0 for my y-intercept. So f of 0, 0 cubed minus 6 times 0 squared minus 7 times 0. What is f of 0? Zero? Zero. 0, right? And we'll get to a point where we don't even have to write that out. You should be able to look at it and know that that would cause all three terms to 0 out, so just 0, and your intercept is 0, 0. Okay? We good? All right, so, yeah, oh, we totally have time for 12 because it's a whole lot easier than it looks anyway. Let's look at 12. So, zeros. 0 equals the square root of x plus 1 minus 2. Does this one look difficult to you when you first glance at it? Yes, because it looks different than the rest, right? And you're like, I don't even know what the heck to do. Now, should that be plus or minus? No, unless you introduce that, no. If it's already there, you don't get to go add stuff. Am I going to have to do some sort of weird stuff here? No, but I do want to get this term by itself, so I'm going to move the 2 over. So this becomes 2 equals square root of x plus 1. I need to get x by itself, so how do I get rid of the square root sign? I square both sides, so this gives me 4 equals x plus 1. So what does x equal? 3, right? It looked way worse, a whole lot easier than the rest of them, or at least faster anyway. So you only have one answer, but it's still a set. It's just a set of one thing. And then let's go ahead and get the y-intercept. So f of 0, 
is equal to the square root of 0 plus 1 minus 2. 0 plus 1 is 1. What's the square root of 1? 1. So this is 1 minus 2. So f of 0 equals negative 1. Everybody okay with that? Any questions? All right. Now, I am after school. I'm going to finish this video. I'm going to do number 11. So if you want to see that example and get it written down, um, the video will be available later this evening, and you can go and get that last example done if it helps you to see it, okay? All right, so I'm going to finish up and do number 11 for you. I want to find my zeros. So I set 0 equal to 3x cubed plus 13x squared minus 10x. So I want to factor out my GCF. If I have one, in this case I do, and it is x. So I'm going to factor out that x. This becomes 3x squared plus 13x minus 10. Okay, now um, I don't have a as 1, so I'm going to have to factor by grouping. So 3 times a negative 10 gives me a negative 30. You've got to be very careful. There's a whole lot of the same wrong thing that happens here, especially on this question or ones like it where something like this can happen. So when I go to split this into four terms, I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to give me negative 30 and then would combine to give me 13. Well, 3 and 10 work, except that since this is negative, these two, the signs have to be different. Since the signs have to be different, that means they have to subtract to give me 13, not add. So 3 and 10 are not the numbers that I'm using. For 30, I could have 1 and 30. I could have 2 and 15. I could have 3 and 10. I could have 5 and 6. And then that's it, right? So when I go to choose these, I get my 3x squared. When I split this, the signs have to be different. So if these signs were different, I'm going to get 7 of some version, right? Instead, when I subtract, I don't want that 7, but 15 and 2 can subtract to give me 13. Then I also have to make decisions on the signs of those numbers. If I want a positive 13, that means that it's going to be a positive 15x and a negative 2x minus 10. So a whole, um, whole lot of people want to jump at that 3 and 10 because it looks good, but it really it doesn't work. So now that I have it split up, I can group these. And when I do that, I'm going to throw those brackets in there so I don't confuse myself with the, all the parentheses. So x and then a bracket so I can do my thing in here. I can factor out a 3x, so that leaves me with x plus 5. Here I'm going to factor out a negative 2. So that leaves me with x. Since I factored out a negative 2, this sign changes to a positive 5. And remember, these two things should match. So now I can drop my brackets and I get x. I'm going to factor this out and I get x plus 5. And then 3x minus 2. I have three terms here, so I'm going to have three answers. I've got x equals 0 x plus 5 equals 0, and 3x minus 2 equals 0. So that's one of them. Then I'm also going to get x equals negative 5, and when I add 2 over here and divide by 3, I get x equals 2 thirds. So those are my three zeros. Put them in my little solution set. Start with my negative 5, then 0, then 2 thirds. Then my y-intercept. My y-intercept, I'm going to find f of 0, and this gives me 3 times 0 cubed plus 13 times 0 squared minus 10 times 0. Well, all of those terms zero out, so f of 0 is 0. That's my y-intercept. There you go. Factoring is not as scary as you think it is, but it takes you actually writing things down in an organized fashion, not trying to skip steps and be lazy and not writing stuff out, because a lot of times you just end up confusing yourself. Okay, so there you go. Let me know if you have any questions.